Welcome to Entrepreneurship 101. Tonight we have our second Lived It Lecture of the Year, which focuses on clean tech. And we're delighted to welcome the founder and chief technology officer of Hydrogenics, Joe Carnelli. We have John Docht from the lead of the clean tech team here at Mars, who will um, formally introduce him. I'm just here to give you a, a, some announcements um, before we start. So Marielle, who runs the course, um, gets a lot of questions and is the, the person behind Entrepreneurship 101 at MarsDD.com. Gets a lot of questions about some stuff, so she asked me if I could make some announcements today about different ways that um, we do communications and where you can find the videos and so forth. So if you've signed up for the course online, you only have to sign up one time. You're signed up for the newsletter that comes out on Mondays. In that newsletter, there's a link to the blog, which in the blog has the video and slides um, as the video and slides. And there's also other announcements and upcoming lectures in the newsletter. So there's the E101 newsletter on Mondays. The, the blog on for E101 also comes out every Monday. So th that's another way of keeping in touch and sort of seeing what's happening with the course. Again, the videos are posted within the blog. We also started a LinkedIn group this year, and we have about 100 members. And we've had some conversations going, but we're hoping to get a lot more going on. If you look for Entrepreneurship 101 on LinkedIn, um, you can join the group there. And we're hoping that you'll post um, things that are relevant to the course or ask questions or um, find a way to engage with your peers because we know this lecture style format um, is not optimal for uh, networking and meeting other entrepreneurs all the time. Um, I just did post some interesting news on the LinkedIn group today. If you remember, the first lived it lecture was the Mobility CEO. He's actually just resigned, which was very interesting. So join our LinkedIn group, because we have good stuff on there, and you can, you can get all the gossip. Um, we also have Twitter. Uh, we have the hashtag, which is the hash ENT101. So um, we're, we're looking at ways where we can show tweets, maybe during the Q&A and stuff. It, it might not happen soon, but we're trying to get more engaged with Twitter, because I know we've had some, some people ask about that. And lastly, uh, there's been some juggling around of lectures before Christmas. So we. Um, to accommodate speakers, we've had to juggle around the lectures. November 30th is Value Proposition with Joe Wilson. Uh, December 7th is the Meet the Entrepreneurs for Clean Tech. So that's the panel of uh, hot up and coming startups. And December 14th is a board of directors and other advisors with David Pazika. So how to build, how to work with advisors, who to look for when you're building your board, that kind of stuff. So those are my sort of housekeeping announcements. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say was next week we're going to announce the workshops that we're putting on for the Upstart competition. If you missed last week, uh, we the first 10 minutes I, I talked about the Upstart competition, the deadlines, the rules, and all that kind of stuff. So you can watch, look for the blog or last week's video for that information. And to help people prepare for the deadline to enter, enter in early February, in January we're going to be running some workshops for people that are interested. So we'll announce those next week and let you know more about them. So I'd like to welcome John Doctorum to the stage. Thanks very much. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and to uh, get to introduce Joe. It's not very often that this happens, but I, I didn't need to look at his bio. I've uh, known Joe for, uh, for 10 years and uh, worked with him for quite a while. Um, 10 years ago, I uh, uh, started working at Hydrogenics with him, and that's the company that he founded in uh, 1995 after finishing his uh, master's in mechanical engineering at U of T. And uh, there, there's, there's no one that I've learned more about succeeding in the business world from than Joe. So I couldn't think of a better person to uh, speak here tonight at our Clean Tech Lived It lecture. He uh, typically likes to uh, fly under the radar, so I was glad that he was uh, willing to do this and agreed to uh, come and speak to everyone. When I uh, joined Hydrogenics, um, I had been watching the fuel cell industry for a little while, and I saw the industry then the same way that I do now, in that hydrogen is really the single most dramatic and effective way that the conventional energy industry can be changed. And it's also the uh, single best way that we can actually hold the clock on uh, climate change. Um, now at that time, I also realized that it was going to take a long time for hydrogen to move forward before we'd all be 
driving hydrogen vehicles and whatnot. Um, but what hydrogenics has been able to do is quite remarkable, and they've done a lot more for the hydrogen and fuel cell industry than any of us hydrogen enthusiasts would have uh, dreamed was possible. Um, the company today is uh, the world's largest provider of on-site hydrogen generation. They have product in over 60 countries around the world. And um, they have an order backlog of about $25 million right now um, in, in revenue. In the eight years that I worked with Joe, I saw him uh, con consistently um, prove the industry wrong when it came to cost and when it came to durability on fuel cell systems. And I saw him take a lot of things that seemed like uh, crazy wishful thinking into a commercial reality. And uh, he, he's great at dealing with not only the technical challenges of the business, but also the business side of it. And uh, he always takes a steady and, and very pragmatic approach to solving problems. One thing that I uh, also really admire is that uh, throughout the history of the company, from the time it went public to several acquisitions along the way, there were many times when Joe could have uh, exited and just kicked his feet back and relaxed, but uh, he, he, he never did. He kept showing up uh, every single day and still does now. And uh, we should all be grateful for that because what's going on in hydrogenics today is going to have a huge impact. And the best times for the company are, uh, are still ahead of it. Um, under his leadership, he is um, g going down a path of combining stationary and transportation power, things that will dramatically change two huge industries. And uh, people around the world are now seeing uh, through his vision, uh, the ability for this tiny little hydrogen molecule to provide vast amounts of energy storage. And they've started, um, w one example of that is recently they sold a, a couple more hydrogen generation systems in Germany where they're taking wind power, turning it into fuel for vehicles. So quite a remarkable feat. Um, also on the grid management side, they've been able to show our um, independent electricity system operator that hydrogen can also play a role in helping to manage supply and demand. Um, so I have no doubt that uh, the company is going to, to continue on its current path under Joe's leadership and really bring hydrogen into the mainstream electricity market. Uh, I could go on for a long time here, but I, I won't. The, the last thing I want to say is that if you uh, were to ever find yourself in a uh, boardroom negotiating a lawsuit with a large multinational company or on the other side of the world trying to close a, a huge business deal in your industry, Joe is the, definitely the person you would want by your side. So please welcome him up here. John, thank you very much for that uh, very warm introduction. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's truly my pleasure to uh, be here this evening and to be able to share with you the hydrogenic story, uh, my story, a story that is uh, deeply rooted in energy technology and uh, deeply rooted uh, in change. When I think back to uh, 1995, when we first started uh, Hydrogenics, I can still remember some basic elements of the business plan. Now that was over 15 years ago. Um, but what still sticks in my mind was back then, we believed that hydrogen and fuel cells would be big, that there would be hydrogen fuel cells in cars and hydrogen fuel cells in buses and planes and submarines. There would be fuel cell power generators for homes and businesses. And of course, the list went on. I think we even included uh, that there would be fuel cell powered flashlights and that they would be sold at Walmart. Um, the technology, of course, we believed would be disruptive and that it would change things. It would change them for the better. Um, and it would change the way things were done in the past. So looking back, it's astonishing uh, really to me to see that many of the beliefs we had, the ideas we had, have actually held true. 
My plan this evening is uh, to share with you the, the journey that started over 15 years ago, as well as some of the lessons learned. Um, what I think I will do is I plan on giving you the, I guess, some of the learnings or key messages of the presentation up front. So uh, the first word that came to mind as I try to put this presentation together and sort of amass 15 years of, uh, of lessons and experiences, the word vision. Um, when you start off, you're, you really need to sort of look into the future and try to predict, uh, try to envision, I guess, um, what the world will be like five years, 10 years, 15 years out. Um, the next word that uh, I guess came to mind as I thought about the presentation was uh, passion. And uh, you're going to need a lot of passion if you're going to embark on a journey to start a venture. Um, and it really needs to make you unafraid to fail. The uh, next key word uh, that came to mind was timing. And of course, timing, it's often difficult to predict with any uh, sense of clarity when things are actually going to happen. All that needs to be kind of factored into a plan. And uh, the last word that came to mind was focus. Um, as you embark on a journey, don't get distracted. Hold the line. Keep going. So uh, my story actually starts back... Whoops. I just want to back off one. So my story actually starts back in 1981, uh, really with the first flight of the uh, space shuttle, the Space Shuttle Columbia, if you can believe it. I was in grade six. And uh, I guess having seen the, uh, the first space shuttle uh, take off, it sort of really left an impression on me. And it was at that point that I had my first introduction to this gas called hydrogen. My uh, uh, dad took me out to Canadian Tire. We purchased a battery charger. I had a science fair presentation uh, to do. We, I guess, Jimmy rigged an electrolyzer, created, uh, some, created an anode, an electrode, put some water in a bucket, threw some salt in the water, mixed the water up, plugged in the battery charger, uh, grabbed two cups, one for the anode, one for the cathode, and lo, lo and behold, we were making uh, hydrogen on one side and oxygen on the other. And uh, the, the big event in the science fair for me was being able to take that cup that had hydrogen, flipping it, lighting a match, and then watching that hydrogen flame burn uh, through the cup. Um, it was in university, though, that I really got hooked on the science in the field. There was an applied science professor in mechanical engineering. And at the end of every lecture, he would really give a, uh, I guess, a status update on the field, on the technology, where fuel cells were going to go, uh, and I think it was at that point that I, uh, I really got inspired. I went on to finish my mechanical engineering degree. Uh, I then went on to do a Master's of Applied Science. I did both uh, of the uh, theses on hydrogen and fuel cells, even started my PhD, got all the courses out of the way, um, and uh, didn't complete my PhD because I ended up starting hydrogenics. Uh, it was again in university where I would uh, meet my my two partners, uh, Pierre Rivard and Boy Taylor, we uh, each brought something different, I guess, to the mix or, or to the team. Uh, Pierre was the dreamer of the three. He wrote the business plan. Fuel cells were going and everything. Uh, Boyd was the salesperson and I was the mechanical engineer. It was my job to build things and make sure things worked. Um, at the time, I was 26 years old. Being of uh, Italian descent, I was still living at home. Uh, I took all the uh, money that I had, which was uh, about $10,000. We each took $10,000 and put them in the company. Um, we each grabbed, I guess, a desk from home. We rented about 700 square feet on top of my uh, dad's machine shop. And uh, that was uh, literally the start of Hydrogenics uh, over 15 years ago. Um, having started uh, the company, the pressure to quickly identify with something, to be able to sell, uh, to generate revenue so that you could pay, pay the bills was uh, strong right from the beginning. Uh, the first thing we did was that uh, we went on a roadshow. We went to every company, every institution, every university that was working in the field, and we talked to a lot of people. We traveled from Chicago all the way up to Quebec City, and uh, there were times where I thought I knew where every single pothole was between here and Montreal. Uh, and in our, in our travels and in talking to people in the industry, 
we quickly identified uh, an industry need. Companies developing fuel cells would need test stations, and they would need sophisticated test stations. And so we chucked that business plan that we had created uh, out the windows we were driving, and uh, we focused on developing uh, fuel cell test stations. Uh, the year was 1996. We immediately created a web page. There was this software called Corel Draw. I don't know how many of you remember Corel Draw, but we graphically designed a test station. We had all the features on the web page and uh, started the company that way. Uh, and lo and behold, a few months later, we landed our first contract, and the contract was with NASA. So NASA was developing fuel cells for the um, uh, space industry. They were scaling up the power of their fuel cells, and they needed a sophisticated test station. Um, so in four years, we went from literally nothing in hydrogen and fuel cells and test stations to becoming the world's largest fuel cell test station company in the world. Uh, you can see uh, some images of the, of the equipment that uh, was sold back in the day. Um, when we analyzed uh, the competitive base of the field, um, all of our competition was developing test equipment for very small lab-based fuel cells. Um, we quickly identified that if there was going to be an industry, if there were going to be fuel cells in cars and buses, etc., the fuel cells would need to be a lot larger, hence the test stations would need to be a lot larger. So we focused hard on making very large or high power test stations, things in the order of 10, 100, 250 kilowatts of power. So uh, very quickly we filled the labs of uh, many of uh, the world's largest companies that at the time were getting into fuel cells, companies like United Technologies, Toyota, Nissan, General Motors, Hyundai, Opel, 3M, W.L. Gore, Renault, Peugeot, and the list went on and on. All these companies uh, adopted hydrogenics test equipment to scale up and develop their fuel cell technology. It was in those years that the company was recognized as one of the uh, fastest growing companies in Canada, I think two years in a row, uh, by Profit Magazine. In 2000, Hydrogenics became a public company. Uh, being a public company brought its own set of challenges, as you might imagine. The company grew very quickly, in hindsight, too quickly. Along the way, we made some acquisitions, some good, some not so good. In 2002, we acquired a test station company in Germany. Today, uh, that company is the center of our technology development in Germany on fuel cells as well as energy storage. In 2003, we acquired another test station competitor in Vancouver, and it was decided to uh, transfer the entire test station business at Hydrogenics here in Toronto, which by then was in the 20 to 30 million dollar in revenue. And we transferred that entire business to this newly acquired company. A mistake. We lost the focus uh, in that business segment, and today Hydrogenics is no longer in the test station business, having uh, licensed the technology to former employees. And I can't say that uh, I'm proud, or I'm proud to say that the that the technology still resides in Canada and that that company is doing extremely well. Now the uh, test station journey was not in vain. There were definitely a lot of lessons learned. Um, so what did the test station uh, leave me with? Well, uh, it really provided me with perspective. So in uh, early 2000, as we began to sort of exit the test station business, uh, as a young engineer, I had the chance to travel the world. I had been in every single, well, in just about every single fuel cell lab around the world, um, state-of-the-art facilities, testing the latest materials. And uh, what the test station business did for me was is that it gave me industry perspective. I was given a bird's eye view of the entire industry, what materials were being developed, what technologies were promising, which ones weren't promising. So I guess with, uh, with with that view in hand, the company, Hydrogenics, then began to focus heavily on our next business segment, which is the uh, hydrogen fuel cell segment. You need to understand that uh, back in early 2000, you could not go out there and buy a fuel cell. Um, the fuel cell industry was at such a nascent state that really the materials weren't even there to sort of cobble together and assemble a fuel cell. Every single part literally had to be built up from scratch. Because of the test station business, though, we had some uh, key perspective in the, in the industry. 
companies like 3M and WL Gore that you're probably familiar with were focusing huge amounts of resources and money in developing a key component of uh, the PEM fuel cell. Uh, it's called the membrane or the membrane electrode assembly. Now, because of that knowledge, Hydrogenics made a key strategic decision, and that was not to invest a single dollar in that component. Our belief was, or the strategy was, that these companies would dominate that material, that they would invest heavily, that they would lead, and that uh, the smarter companies would uh, use that material development effort and adopt it in their technology, and that was at the heart of our strategy. So while we didn't invest a single dollar in that key component, many of our competitors that, that didn't have that bird's eye view uh, invested extremely heavily and um, were almost sort of locked into a technology because of the investments that they had made five years and ten years earlier. Um, it was uh, in mid-2000 um, that we focused extremely hard on the fuel cell, the fuel cell module, we were able to attract some really bright minds at Hydrogenics. Um, and we were able to uh, develop a world-class fuel cell technology that, that today allows us to work with a lot of OEMs and participate in a lot of markets. Um, Hydrogenics is uh, big in the fuel cell bus market. We've got buses, uh, hydrogen fuel cell buses running in uh, certain areas of the US, in Germany, uh, in Italy, in Spain. Uh, we're working very hard in backup power where fuel cells have a lot of promise. And uh, remember that business plan where we said hy hydrogen fuel cells would be in planes and submarines? Well, I, I can still remember that I wasn't a big believer that fuel cells would make it in those applications. But lo and behold, um, we're providing fuel cells to uh, submarine applications for air-independent propulsion systems. And we're working with companies like Airbus and Germany's DLR in providing fuel cells for airplanes. Uh, the fuel cell journey, though, has been a tough one. Um, there were huge technical challenges when we started, uh, performance, durability, and not to mention cost. Um, all, of these all of the technical performances have uh, largely been addressed, and we're working very hard to bring the cost down. As we bring the cost down, certain markets start opening up for us. Now, for me, the, for me personally, the darkest day um, uh, in terms of fuel cell history within hydrogenics had to be in 2009 when the Secretary of Energy of the United States, Dr. Chu, <clears throat> and the Obama administration went on record in saying that fuel cells for vehicle applications would never happen. You would need uh, three miracles to make fuel cells happen. So we sort of see physics and politics going head to head. Um, Dr. Chu went on to severely cut fuel cell and hydrogen funding uh, in the US. And of course, Canada followed uh, right after. I could see sort of history repeating itself in North America. I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but back in 1982, North America was a hotbed in wind energy technology. Companies in North America were literally head to head uh, in developing technology with companies in Denmark and Germany. Um, in 1983-84, someone in the Department of Energy also went on record saying that wind energy um, is never going to make it. They'll never get the cost down. Uh, we know how the story ended. Countries like Denmark and Germany continued to invest heavily. They had a longer term plan, and today the majority of the technology, the majority of the wind turbines come out of those two countries. So there's definitely a lesson to, a lesson to be learned there. Now, um, back in 1995, when we started and focused on developing the vision, there was one more key element in that vision, uh, and that was that uh, hydrogen in the future would be green. And what I mean by that is we, in the industry, we typically characterize hydrogen as black hydrogen or green hydrogen. For us, black hydrogen is hydrogen that is derived from non-renewable resources. Uh, the majority of the hydrogen today is derived from natural gas. So uh, it was our belief that uh, for hydrogen to make a difference, it has to be green hydrogen. It, it has to be linked to renewable. It has to come from water. So as early as 1998, um, Hydrogenics began to pioneer uh, an advanced form of electrolysis called PEM electrolysis. 
In 2005, Hydrogenix acquired a local company called Steward Energy. In my mind uh, at the time and still today, a brilliant move. Uh, it was a step closer to the, uh, to the vision. Uh, Steward Energy was a world leader in electrolysis with a history dating back to 1948. This company at the time of our acquisition though had its own issues going on. They were migrating their technology which was uh, um, old, dating back to, as I said, uh, the, uh, the 50s, the 60s, and they were migrating to a new technology. They were experiencing, uh, I guess, quality issues, technology development issues. At the same time, they acquired uh, a competitor in Europe, uh, in Belgium. And right after they acquired this company in Belgium, Hydrogenix came in and acquired uh, Stuart Energy. Now, you think we uh, would have learned something after a couple of acquisitions, but uh, not always the case. Now, the lesson for me after three acquisitions, which for it's forever ingrained in my mind, is a simple two-step process for successful acquisitions. Uh, I guess for step one is uh, have a plan laid out, a detailed plan, before execution of the acquisition. Sounds pretty simple. Plan it out well in advance. And uh, the second thing uh, I think that I learned after a couple of these acquisitions was uh, once you have the plan, execute it very, very quickly into the integration of the company. Uh, the steward acquisition proved to be a difficult one uh, for me personally. I had uh, supported the acquisition of uh, Steward Energy and uh, the integration uh, wasn't going so well once we got into it. I was spending months and months of my time in Belgium understanding the company, the people, the technology, the product, the issues. Uh, we discovered and suffered through some quality issues, but we ended up consolidating and simplifying the product line. We brought on an amazing general manager um, out of Thunder Bay. In the end, we succeeded. Uh, we were able to turn the company around. Today, we're the largest electrolyzer company in the world. Uh, we're recognized as having leading technology and we're invited to participate in projects all over the world. Um, our equipment is used in many critical industrial applications where hydrogen is a key part of the process. Uh, our equipment is used in float glass manufacturing, chip fabrication, solar cell fabrication, generator cooling, uh, and the list goes on and on. One uh, application that is, uh, is exciting for me is the growing hydrogen fueling station market. Hydrogenics has uh, delivered over 40 fueling stations around the world. These are used to fuel hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell buses. The, uh, the picture that you see here is uh, one of the uh, latest wins that we have uh, in Germany. It's a station that's under construction right now in Hafen City in Hamburg. And uh, the station belongs to an electric utility, which is uh, very exciting for us. We're starting to uh, really drive home the connection between the electrical grid, renewable energy, and this energy vector, hydrogen. It's a uh, 1.2 megawatt fueling station. It uses hydrogenix electrolysis equipment and it will be fueling uh, buses and vehicles in that city. And as I said, hydrogenix has over 40 stations around the world. They tend to be clustered in what I would call uh, focus clusters for fuel cell vehicles, primarily California, Japan, uh, and Germany. Um, I, I now want to move on to an area that uh, really for me is really, really exciting and um, really sort of completes the vision that we had for hydrogenics going back 15 uh, years ago. Uh, because of our world leading position in electrolysis, uh, today hydrogenics is on the cusp of realizing what is, uh, uh, again, as I said, at the heart of the vision and what was touted as one of hydrogen's great promises. Uh, the, uh, the ability of hydrogen to become and be a major energy carrier. Um, events in Fukushima uh, and policy decisions in Germany in uh, the recent year have really uh, began to sort of change the industry for hydrogenics. 
We're now on a different path. These, we have new accelerators. Uh, Germany as a country, as I said, has uh, publicly announced that uh, they're moving away from nuclear energy and they've put a plan together to uh, move to 80% renewable by 2030, which is a phenomenal uh, vision for, for a country. Now, I, I sort of wanna end my presentation talking about this application uh, that we're working on. Uh, uh, I can say I'm a sound sleeper and nothing has really ever affected my sleep, but I, I do lose sleep thinking about this one application. Uh, we call it power to gas. And uh, what uh, this new concept that we're developing plans to do is really bridge the two large energy silos that exist in our world today. So today, the world as we know it has the electrical grid energy silo and the natural gas distribution and infrastructure silo. Two very large energy silos with very little interaction uh, between those two silos. And what Hydrogenics has is uh, uh, because of our, um, I guess, strength in electrolysis, because of our technology development, um, we are sitting with what I call the bridging technology, the bridging technology between those two energy silos that will allow the transfer of energy from that one silo, the electrical grid, to that other major silo, the natural gas grid, where today, as I said, they're sort of independent silos. The ability to bridge those silos is going to provide uh, some big benefits to society. Uh, the, the big one that I see is when you think of countries like Germany and their plan to move to 80% 80 re 80 renewable, you've got some major challenges as you think about how you're going to uh, balance the grid. What type of energy technology are you going to use to store energy? And the concept of power to gas is fairly simple. Electrolysis becomes the tool, as I said, to bridge those two silos, and hydrogen is the energy carrier that will move energy between those silos. So the concept, as I said, is fairly simple. Electrolysis is an electrical device that consumes electricity and produces hydrogen. You're going to be able to move electricity from the electrical grid when you need to, in the amount you need to, and you'll be able to move it into the existing natural gas infrastructure. There, you're going to be able to raise the uh, utilization rate of existing assets. You're going to be able to bring on more renewable, el renewable energy on the electrical grid. And at the same time, you're going to be able to balance the grid. Uh, today, most of the grid balancing uh, is done by generators. So we use generating capacity to provide grid balancing. And as you might imagine, it's not the best use of a generator. Uh, generators like to operate at a uh, fixed point uh, where the efficiency is highest. When we think of the term smart grid and what that means, what that means for me and what it means for hydrogenics is uh, smart grid is about using additional resources in a different way to provide value and raise the overall efficiency of the grid. And uh, with hydrogen and with electrolysis, we're moving into, uh, I guess, an era that that uh, will sort of define what we call the smart energy grid. Uh, we're working with major utilities around the world to move this concept forward. Um, and again, uh, lots of work going on in Germany. And as I said, this is a uh, very, very exciting uh, area of development for hydrogenics. And as an engineer and as a technical person, it's certainly uh, a main driver for me and all the people working at hydrogenics. So uh, that uh, almost takes us uh, to today, uh, which is definitely not the end of the journey. Uh, still lots of uh, work to do. Um, as John mentioned, uh, the company today is a recognized world leader in hydrogen fuel cells and hydrogen generation technology. We have 120 employees. We have three facilities, one right here in Toronto, one in Germany, one in Belgium. We have uh, sales offices in Moscow, uh, in China, in India, in California. Um, we have over 1,800 hydrogen products deployed in a whole bunch of countries. Uh, for me, the vision remains as clear uh, today as it was 15 years ago. Uh, thank you very much.
So if we have any questions, could you go to the, the mics or I can bring them in from webcasting as they come in? Um, I have a question to start with. What, what, uh, what have been some of the biggest challenges that you have had as an entrepreneur? Uh, there have been many. I mean, I guess uh, <clears throat> in a company you go through different phases. Um, and uh, in a technology company, I would say financing a technology company certainly uh, has always been a challenge. Uh, probably uh, the biggest challenge has been sort of the roller coaster ride that you have as a technology company, um, uh, certainly when you're talking about energy. Uh, as uh, in North America, we tend to have a very short, what I would call short-sighted um, short plan when we think of developing technology. Uh, if it doesn't happen in the first three or four years, it's never going to happen. That's probably been the biggest challenge that uh, I think we've faced. Uh, countries like Germany and Japan are able to put together longer plans as a society or as a government and industry in those countries is... Uh, is maybe better able to plan uh, and develop. Thanks. Go, go ahead. Um, sorry, I just didn't understand quite what you were saying in your last bit. Like it was very interesting, but I just didn't quite understand. How do you use fuel cells to bridge between gas power and electrical power? I mean, fuel cells will generate power for electrical, but how do they generate power for gas, and then how do they bridge between? Right. So Hydrogenx uh, today has two business units. One business unit is the hydrogen fuel cell business unit. The other business unit is the hydrogen generation or electrolysis business unit. So it's the electrolyzer that is going to be the bridge between the electrical grid and uh, the, call it the natural gas infrastructure uh, portion. So the electrolyzer is going to be the device that uh, will be able to move energy when we need it, in the amount we need it, in the scale that we need it, into the existing natural gas infrastructure. Hydrogen and natural gas will be commingled. Uh, you may think that's crazy, but 50 years ago, the natural gas infrastructure was actually, uh, it actually contained a large amount of hydrogen with the natural gas. And there are places in the world today, for example, Hawaii, uh, runs 10% hydrogen uh, in its natural gas infrastructure. Does that answer your question? I don't understand, but it uh, well, let me let me. Well, I'm a technical guy, so sometimes I I, uh, I I think I say things either too high level or not simple enough. So um, you've got the electrical grid uh, that in many places, even here in Ontario, there's plans on bringing on more renewable energy. Uh, bringing on more renewable energy is uh, going to be somewhat of a problem in that renewable energy is not dispatchable. You can't call on the wind turbine to give you the power when you need it. So the grid operator uh, is going to have an issue, certainly as you bring on more renewable energy. So the electrolyzer, a 10 megawatt facility, a 50 megawatt facility, an electrolyzer is a load. It's like a light bulb. When you turn on an electrolyzer, it sucks electrical power, and the output is hydrogen. At the same time that this electrolyzer is sucking electrical power from the grid, when required by the grid operator, it's providing grid stabilization services and generating hydrogen at the same time, the grid operator is going to be able to move, when needed and in the amount needed, energy into the natural gas infrastructure. So when we think of energy storage, many people think of batteries, flywheels. They will, uh, today we're using them, they, they, they of course will exist, but hydrogen is uh, going to play a very specific role. In my mind, there's really no technology that will be able to play at the scale that's required by electric utilities to store hydrogen. Does that? Yes, now I get it. Okay, we have a question from Nilo on the, uh, one of our webcasters. Um, and this is a question actually I was thinking myself. I think with hydrogen it's confusing because there's people that say, you know, this is a great technology and there's people that say, you know, hydrogen fuel cells um, won't work. And his question is, in a fairly new and niche industry, how did you go about finding and convincing investors? So basically, um, what was your value proposition for the investment community? So uh, uh, that's a very good question. 
if you go back and look at the history of fuel cells, um, um, hydrogenics got started in 1995. At the time, um, I guess the world was going through its sort of typical uh, in and out of favor, and uh, really the, the industry or the world was falling out of favor with batteries. Everyone knows batteries are very popular today. Electric vehicles are very popular. But in 1993-92, batteries really hadn't delivered on the promise of becoming uh, the prominent uh, technology for electric vehicle propulsion. Uh, very similar to the issues that they face today, they couldn't store a lot of energy. And uh, there was this large re recharge time. And batteries were falling out of favor very quickly. And uh, I guess we had the good luck of sort of entering uh, the fuel cell industry at a time when it was really on the rise. And uh, so there were a lot of big promises made by a lot of companies on uh, when fuel cells were going to become commercial. So uh, we started in 1996 and went public in 2000. And uh, financing the company um, really wasn't a problem and attracting investors wasn't a problem. We were growing our revenue fairly rapidly. We had focused on test stations. We had gone from zero to over 20, $25 million in revenue and test equipment. Um, it was phenomenal growth if you can imagine going from zero to that amount of revenue in those years. So financing the company in the early years, absolutely not a problem. The difficulty came in when the internet bubble uh, collapsed. Uh, tech companies sort of went out of favor and uh, then it became hard uh, to finance the company. And you really had to have your ducks all lined up and your story had to be solid. You needed a solid management team, et cetera, et cetera. Question from the audience, maybe the one in the back. Hi, I wanted to ask you from a business perspective, how much of an uncertainty is it, the fact that as you were talking about, the things are cyclical or that the demand for your product could rise or fall based on elections being that, that energy is such a hot issue, uh, a pipeline is built or it's not built and, and this may have an effect on what you're doing. How, how do you deal with the uncertainties? Have you had to go as far as getting involved in lobbying or anything like that? And how has that affected your business? Well, all of the um, events that I talked about on the journey were, were really, when I uh, think back, really unpredictable. Um, you know, you were, you were focused on the business, you were focused on the technology, and the industry certainly is bigger than just hydrogenics. There's politics, country, or, or uh, maybe jurisdictional type politics. Very hard to sort of predict the events that uh, occurred. I think as a company, what, uh, what we were good at was we were able to sort of adapt very quickly when sort of uh, something would come up, something uh, good or bad. So being able to quickly respond to changes in the, call it political climate, uh, proved to be very important. Um, you constantly need to be sort of monitoring change and one of the first words I used was vision. Well, vision is, you know, again, trying to predict the future. So you're always trying to sort of look out and make sure that, you know, does the plan match up with the events that you see, adjust the plan a little bit, continue to monitor the events and continue to adapt and be nimble. Go ahead. Miroslav uh, Grudziński. I'm very, very honored today to hear this fantastic, successful story uh, on the global scale coming out of the Canadian heart. So thank, thank you. you so much. I'm very proud of you, sir. Uh, the question for me is... Thank you. <laughs> the question for me is when the vision and all this uh, extraordinary a focus and performance with this devoted team uh, cooperating so strongly uh, with already written business plan and approach to the investors. The question is, which part of the world, I'm talking about the financial world, recognize the vision and where from the most of the capital came uh, for the innovation? This is the first question. The second question is, how the environment, how the weather, political weather, uh, in the sense of the Canadian government, 
uh, recognize such a visionary approach and how this visionary approach is bringing the excellence of the Canadian mind, Canadian uh, innovation on the global scale was recognized by the government of Canada. This is the first and at the same time how the world percepts the Canadian excellence with such a big impact on the global environment. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm going to take your question maybe in, in different order. Um, so, um, <clears throat> during the journey, um, there were key individuals that uh, had a huge impact uh, on the industry, on the industry in Canada, on the hydrogen fuel cell industry in Canada, and on hydrogenics. Um, I can remember one individual in particular. Um, he was a government official working for Enercan, a Dr. Martin Hammerley. I, I call him the godfather of hydrogen and fuel cells in Canada. And uh, if you really had to go back and sort of uh, ask yourself, how did the industry start and take off in Canada and even outside of Canada, I'd have to sort of link it back uh, to Dr. Martin Hammerley. Um, it was through his vision in uh, identifying the technology, in sponsoring uh, various companies out there, Hydrogenics included, he was a, a huge sponsor, in promoting the technology and these companies on a global scale. Um, if I had to pick one individual that, that really started it off, I think for the Canadian fuel cell and hydrogen industry, it would be uh, uh, this man. Perfect. The, uh, the other question was where did uh, where did uh, the, most of the capital uh, come from? And uh, most of the, uh, when I think back, again, uh, we went public in 2000. If you can remember, uh, that those, were, that those were the uh, internet years. Uh, all you needed was a dot com at the end of your name and, and you could become a pub public company. We were one of the last companies to go public uh, before the entire market collapsed. Um, I can remember we went public on a Wednesday and the markets literally collapsed on the Thursday. Uh, most, of, uh, most of the funding came out of institutional investors, primarily out of the U.S., obviously, because of the size of the financial market there, um, but uh, also a substantial portion out of Europe. Uh, and today, I would think that uh, the majority of... Uh, well. We've got a diverse financial holding right now, but uh, certainly uh, a lot of uh, support coming out of Europe right now, and I foresee that to grow uh, in the near future with some of the things that we're working on. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to meet you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Hello. Uh, thank you for the wonderful le lecture. And uh, my question is, uh, you have research and development in different countries, and different countries have uh, different kinds of incentives for research and development, tax regimes, uh, uh, grant, direct grants maybe. In your opinion, uh, what other countries do in that regard better than Canada and what can Canada um, could adopt, maybe learn from other countries in that regard? Thank you. That's a, um, a, very, good, a very good question. I got to make sure uh, I'm careful on what I say here that I don't offend uh, Anybody, but um, I guess um, um, I've uh, spent a lot of time in uh, in in Germany, and I've come to maybe uh, appreciate the way um, Germans approach things. I, I break it down in terms of uh, the Germans like to study a problem first, so they'll study, 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 study. They'll spend uh, years studying the problem. Uh, then they'll take the same amount of time and they'll do a lot of planning and they'll plan, 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 and then plan some more. And then once they've studied and planned, then they execute. Uh, so when you think of the cultural differences, I, I sort of talked about this on my talk between uh, Germany and Canada, that's the main differentiator that I see. And then of course that sort of ties back into uh, that comment I made on the ability the ability to put a plan together. Uh, in North America, as I said, we have difficulty putting together a 10-year plan, and there's no way in hell you're talking about a 20-year plan. And in countries like Japan, I mean, they have 50-year plans that they sort of lay out and then start 
executing on the plan. So maybe the, the, the key difference uh, and maybe the key improvement uh, within Canada, within our space is uh, develop a plan and don't be scared to stick with the plan if you know the plan is right. You know, one of the comments or one of the uh, theme words um, was, you know, hold the line, have the focus, keep driving towards the end goal. Uh, the last thing companies need is sort of, you know, the hot, cold, hot, cold approach. Companies uh, can't deal with uncertainty. They need constant certainty. Thank you. My name is <clears throat> Faisal Karmali with an environmental data analytics and communications startup. Um, if you could go back to your 1990s looking for that first big client, you mentioned some of the big car manufacturers. Could you talk to your strategy of getting in front of them and how you were going to get them on board as a relatively new entity? <clears throat> so uh, one of our uh, first uh, large and major customers was uh, General Motors. So we, we were on top of the machine shop, the phone call came in and it was someone from the General Motors fuel cell program. Um, and uh, at the time we were going contract to contract but we, we quickly realized that this was the marquee customer. Um, this really was the turning point in the I guess first phase of hydrogenics when we were focusing on test stations, uh, General Motors was ramping up their program. They were building a brand new state-of-the-art fuel cell facility. Uh, they had state-of-the-art technology. And we quickly realized that uh, if we can win this customer, if we can do a great job, uh, that this order, this product that we develop, that we were developing for General Motors, would really be the the springboard uh, for our uh, test station uh, product line. And um, it, uh, as if you've ever worked for an automotive company, it can be extremely grueling. We uh, we did about six months of development, delivered the first test station to General Motors. Uh, I can remember the size of the test station distinctly because uh, at the sec in the second floor in the machine shop we had a hatch and that was the only way you were getting anything in or out of that second floor so the machine for General Motors was one inch smaller than the width and length of that hatch. We delivered the test station to General Motors, we turned it on and it didn't work. So mechanical engineer, that was my crash course in uh, uh, heat and mass transfer and fluid dynamics. We, I, I lived in Rochester, I think, for six months as we rectified the problem. Um, and uh, we made that test station work, and that test station really became, as I said, the springboard. It was then that companies like Toyota, 3M, Opel, etc., cetera, uh, recognized the technology that was developed for General Motors, and they made that the standard as well. And very quickly, we we evolved the product and it became uh, the industry standard. A hypothetical question to you. If uh, superconduction of electricity is ever achieved and can be implemented on a commercial scale, what ramifications would it have for your business? Um, it's a, that's a good question. Um, in my mind, you will always need to store energy. Uh, e even today, when you think of those two silos, the electrical grid and the natural gas grid, um, we have energy storage technologies in the electrical grid. Pumped hydro, for example, uh, Niagara Falls will, will pump water back up. Um, in the natural gas distribution and infrastructure grid, uh, we have large salt caverns near Sarnia where we fill these salt ca caverns up with natural gas during the summer so that we can improve deliverability during the winter months. Uh, being able to have uh, or move electricity very quickly still won't solve the problem of when you think of renewable energy, you're generating it most likely at a time when you don't need it. and. Uh, Storage really, the purpose of storage is to fix that mismatch, to be able to bank energy, to move energy uh, second by second, minute to minute, but 
week to week, season to season, when you think of where countries like Germany want to go 80% renewable, there's going to be storage in that German plan. Thank you. Hi, just a quick question about <clears throat> early on, uh, whether you started the company based on a product idea or did you start the company then look uh, at the, then speaking to industry partners, you, you developed an idea? Yeah, I wish, I wish I could go back and say the plan was crystal clear, but for me, for me, and I think for the partners that started Hydrogenics, uh, there really was one goal in mind, and that was to get into this field, to get into the hydrogen and fuel cell field. So that was sort of the, the main overarching driver, and then really, you know, the plan sort of filled in uh, that driver. So we, we as, as you heard from my presentation, we didn't start the company and say, we got to get into test stations. We started the company and said, we want to get into this field. We believe this field would change the world, that it would have ramifications on how we use energy, how we move, et cetera. Uh, so it definitely wasn't sort of product-based. It was uh, maybe more vision-based. But then I think what we were able to do is sort of quickly fill that, that vision plan in with products. We needed to sell something. We needed to quickly come up with a product that someone would buy for X and that it would cost us less than X when we sold it. So we filled the plan in. For me as a mechanical engineer, I like building things. So uh, we went from test stations to fuel cells to now fuel cells and electrolysis. So of course we are product focused today, but the, that overarching vision is there and it really sort of guides what we do and how we do it. For example, we had opportunity uh, during the journey to get into other hydrogen generation technology. So there's a uh, technology out there called reforming. You can take natural gas and you can convert it into hydrogen. You can take liquid fuels and convert it into hydrogen. Didn't really appeal to us. It wasn't green. It didn't fit the vision. So we, we sort of had the vision and focused the product and uh, the markets to align with the vision. Uh, hi, um, I'm curious, when you started, how did you become known? How did you manage to get to close a deal with NASA? How did you get that perspective to, to know who is the people who will use your product when you are starting something that is fairly new? Yeah. So uh, you heard about all my travels between Chicago and mm -hmm. Quebec City. So we, we got out there. We. Uh, met with uh, everyone that was in the industry. Uh, industry conferences were a hotbed uh, in terms of meeting people and sort of understanding the industry. So I would say uh, the main thing that got us started was getting out to industry events and talking to people in the industry, sharing with them your vision. Uh, that was uh, probably the, the number one thing that, that we did. Okay, thanks. Please. Hi, I just wanted to ask you, you number one uh, business line is, I mean, is on, on hydrogen and fuel and applications in it. Right now you have the, uh, the application of bridging the electrical and fuel. My question is, do you have like a budget for research? Because they, there's, uh, there's millions of uh, applications that are, there are. That haven't come up. So do you, do you have a... I absolutely budget? have a budget. Okay. And... Uh, uh, at, you know, at times it's sort of difficult to decide uh, what you focus on. The one thing I think that I've learned, uh, you know, that word focus, um, don't spread yourself too thin. Focus on a few key things that can really make a difference. Um, and today, uh, most of our budget is sort of split, I would say, 50-50 between advancing fuel cell technology and uh, the other 50% is advancing uh, what we call advanced electrolysis. Thank you. Hi, you mentioned um, the Department of Energy uh, and how they sort of doubted the technology and cut spending on it. How do you deal with that sort of like personally? Do you ever doubt it? It's going to happen as well if, if something like that happens? So, no. And I think... Uh, I, I, for me, again, I'm a mechanical engineer. 
Um, you tend to sort of live or die by the physics. Um, what's shocking to me is that the Secretary of Energy has a PhD, and I think it's a PhD in physics, and um, really don't know how to describe it, uh, other than I think uh, in, in technology, you end up getting a lot of politics mixed in with technology, as you heard from my presentation. Um, in 2009, that was probably the darkest day. I mean, we've had tough days at Hydrogenics. The sun is beginning to shine now. Uh, but uh, having the Secretary of Energy of the United States go on record and saying that fuel cell vehicles uh, will not be successful. Uh, on the one hand, I was sad. On the other hand, I really had to laugh it, uh, as I dug in to understand motives. Uh, he had never visited a fuel cell facility. I mean, he's got General Motors uh, in Rochester. Uh, there's United Technologies in Connecticut. He could have uh, visited one of these companies and sort of at least driven a vehicle. Uh, at least have uh, received a presentation on the state of the technology. But uh, uh, he decided not to. And he did probably one of the worst things that governments can do is uh, that he made a choice. I, I, I don't think it's uh, uh, government's role to sort of decide on technology. Uh, it really has to be industry, market forces that really decide on uh, what technology has a future and what technology doesn't. And uh, you heard me talk about the wind industry in the U.S. That's exactly what happened uh, in the early 80s. Uh, they killed the wind industry in North America with the same type, type of comment. Yeah. Also, just one more question. When do you see fuel cell stations coming to Toronto, Canada? <laughs> Uh, that uh, I hope soon, but uh, I, uh, I think what's going to happen is uh, the technology is going to get focused in what I call cluster areas where uh, stronger forces are behind the implementation of the technology. So um, you're going to see fuel cell vehicles deployed in a big way in Japan, in Korea, in Germany, and uh, maybe if California can get its act together in California. So this is where fuel cell vehicles are being introduced today. There's hundreds of vehicles in a lot of these jurisdictions running every day today. There's buses running, et cetera. So uh, it'll, I think it'll take a while before fuel cell vehicles come to Toronto simply because an investment needs to be made in the infrastructure. Certain countries, certain jurisdictions have, uh, have gone online uh, and uh, made the commitment. So Germany has a 2015 plan. The German government has sort of stepped in and corralled industry, industry on the infrastructure side, automotive industry, and said, okay, guys, we got to get this plan together. The car guys aren't going to make the cars if the fueling stations aren't there, and the fueling station guys aren't going to make the fueling stations if they don't know the cars are coming. So let's bring everybody together, and as per the German way, let's put a plan together. And so fuel cell vehicles are coming, but they're going to be localized in, in cluster areas, as is happening uh, today. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, I think it's absolutely wonderful to have a Canadian company at the forefront of what's a game-changing technology. And it's really, really an interesting story. Thank you. Thank you.